South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and I Grow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers.
admit that I'm a little bit out of that loop because that's about the time that I got out of high school and went off to college and went off and did my own thing. And so during that time that I wasn't around, they transitioned to a 100% hotel. Uh, I moved back about 2002 and have been there since. We've kind of primarily gone to a four uh, year rotation. Uh, we have spring wheat or sometimes millet, we winter wheat, then corn or sometimes milo, and then a broad leaf. That broad leaf could be primarily it's been sunflowers. We have uh, safflower, soybeans, uh, chickpeas. I think for us, you know, originally, as I talked to my dad and uncle and, and kind of their thoughts as they first got into no till, one of the things they thought was that right away that it was going to allow them to grow a high use, a high water use crop like milo. Today we think, well, maybe we better plant a milo because it'll kind of dry. So, so that's a little bit of a change. Um, I think we were starting to have weed, weed issues, um, cheap grass or downy bromes, a bit of a problem there, feral rye, uh, certainly some other things as well. I think going to no-till and just the diversity of our rotation, we've cleaned up a lot of those, um, but other things have kind of developed. So we, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a perfect system, at least our system isn't perfect, and we've got some work to do yet. We have not yet got into doing cover crops, and that is on our to-do list to get there, but we have not yet done so. I guess that's kind of our background. Any questions to start off with? Don't make my job too hard. <laughs> Any questions to start off with? Roger, you got to have a question. So, Brett, what's your, what are the resource concerns that you would address with cover crops? You said you're thinking about going that way, and, and why would you want to do that? Sounds question like was, what is Brett's resource concerns? Uh, if you would start to do cover crops, what would you want to address? Well, I should have mentioned that we do have livestock, and uh, we have always had livestock, and, and we'd like to better integrate them into our cropping system. Um, to date, all we do pretty much is graze our, you know, corn stalks, sunflower stalks, milo stalks, um, and so that would be one thing. Um, I think, too, as I look at it, I think we could increase our organic matter uh, over what we've done over the last year. Water, you know, it, we're kind of like this area. We get 17 inches or so, about average. But they're kind of <clears throat> our soils. I talked about loamy soils, but they're anywhere from sandy loam to silt loams, and so some of it is very sandy. And, and we do a lot of good by increasing it. Spring wheat because winter wheat is the best crop. So I tried to do 
shorter, less moisture intense rotations than about last year than since last a year ago, October, this October, in the fall of the county, I think we've had about 38 inches of moisture. So that one didn't work out like I thought it would. But sometimes it's more like six inches of moisture, time or eight. But um, it's, I took for granted the good that we've done in Wyman County on the soils. You kind of, you've been doing this for years, you kind of don't realize how much the soils are improving. When we went to the uh, Fall River farm, we had a, Ray Ward was out for a, got a bus turf from Don't Tell the Plains, and he dug up a chunk of dirt. We'd just been there a year. And he handed me a piece of dirt that was about the size of a bowling ball that was heavier. It was just, it was like a rock. I think I, I think I even dropped it. It was so heavy to pack. And that soil, it's, you know, been eight, nine years later, it's not like it is back home, but it's greatly improved. It is kind of amazing that we can, really not that long of a time to see improvements in our soil. But it's, I, I truly believe that the further west you go, the, the rotations become more challenging. And the options maybe are not quite as much, but part of my problem too is I feel that I, don't, I, don't, I do not have livestock, and that's probably a big part of the equation the further west we go. And I just, that's not in our system. But maybe it will be someday, I don't know. Good. Maybe I have some more questions out there. Back there. Okay. I want to ask Gabe how he deals with uh, livestock water in the winter time when he's getting uh, raising his crop fields.
And those heifers then can be used as a tool and will mock raise them because they'll, they'll put on weight and gain on about anything, it seems. So, so we can use our, our different classes of, of the cattle to do what we want. And, you know, obviously we're not mock raising the, the pigs. Sheep we sure can, but I, I tell people our sheep are on a planned grazing system. Wherever they plan on going, that's where they're going. What resource concern would you use for the mock grazing? Yeah, what resource concern would we use for mock grazing? For instance, the, the, the uh, analogy I showed where we're trying to lay down higher carbon, and we'll do that. You know, time didn't permit this morning for us to go through our whole perennial type system, but on the perennials, we're grazing different classes on the perennials. Cow calf bears are on there at times, uh, the, the grass finished are on there. The, the uh, heifers are on there. And if we have like, uh, there's one whole segment where North Dakota Game and Fish Department came to us and they had a section of land that was heavily infested with noxious weeds. I mean, they were spending 15,000 a year spraying noxious weeds. And they came to us, would you take over management of this section of land and take care of the noxious weeds? And we said, sure, first thing you gotta quit spraying. Second thing is you can impose no restrictions as far as number of AUMs. Then we went in there with high stock density grazing because the reason they had so much noxious weeds, they were letting that land go very low AUMs, 40 animal units, is all they were putting on there. And you had all this litter build up and you get noxious weeds. So we went in there with very high stock density, knocked down all the noxious weeds and now we we're getting a lot of diversity in their native species. So you can use mob grazing to address different resource concerns. Use it as a tool. Katie, any other questions? We've got plenty of time. Far away. I have a question for Mike and Brent. Okay. Do they see any difference in the effectiveness of dry fertilizer versus liquid? For Mike and Brent, do you see any difference between dry fertilizer versus liquid fertilizer? Uh, the main difference I see is that uh, one gets everything still sticky and not very fun to mess with, and so uh, we primarily use dry. Well, that doesn't really address your question. Um, I guess I don't have a good answer for you. I don't know that I have uh, seen it. We, we do put our dry fertilizer in, in the ground, so it's either to the side or in furrow. Um, and uh, I feel like we had pretty good luck with that. Uh, the only liquid that we had used over the years, we did use liquid starter with our planter uh, for a few years. Um, I guess I can't say, the, the thing that is nice about liquid obviously is you can get uh, better blends or easier blends to get what you want. But I don't know that I've seen the difference in terms of crop response. We also carry all of our dry fertilizer with the planter. And you know, with the, now the air seeder now out. Fall weather, we, we do not broadcast the rea. I don't like doing that. Probably um, better if it was a band. It's easier to band with the fertilizer. A lot less likely to lose the liquid fertilizer if it goes on top of the surface. That's, I like to bury it, but that becomes a cost too. If it slows up your planting immensely, um, it's the, you're another over in the ground, so you got more disturbance. It's mud issues when you're planting it. It's, it's not a not a, it's not easy. Uh, we, we set up a plan from west. We did banding the liquid in a band beside the row on top of the ground. Um, I do it. I'm nervous whenever I do it. I, I don't like it being on top of the ground. I feel more comfortable with it you know, planting corn or something early. Planting sunflowers late June it makes me nervous. See, I, we do do the liquid fertilizer. We stream bar the wheat, and we think we're going to have a big crop. We'll run in there, put on an extra 
years in a fertilizer. I think that I, you can really get a bang for your buck when you do that, and it's, uh, I like it. Um, it's, you know, you should try to time rain with it, though, because usually you're the warm, you know, the, it's kind of warm, huh? but um, whenever I don't bury the fertilizer, I'm a little more excited in my response, but it's hard to always get that done. done very little of liquid broadcast on the residue. We did do some last year just to get the pounds out there and it it definitely makes a it rot gets a rot liquid. Which you know, some people say think that's positive. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I what we did it basically was a way to get to alleviate the fertilizer at the planting time. I think there's some advantages to that, but I, I guess overall, I, 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 think I, I guess what I'm used to is burying fertilizer and I like that better, keep the residue on the surface. Okay, you else? Got a question. I had a question for maybe Gabe. You know, he's talking about your cover crop, you lay flat, you're not running tr trash flippers on your corn planter. Have you had? issues with the stand and uh, cold soils in a wet spring and the, the other one is uh, about stripper heads and weed. Any guys use the stripper heads? Or? Yeah, okay, the question about residue and flat. Now, we don't always put the residue flat. You know, there's lots of times I'm growing covers, we're not grazing them, and we'll just no-till right in. But I don't use trash strippers at all because I don't want that disturbed. As far as cold soils, I really believe that as your biology increases, your soils will warm up much quicker, you know, and, and it only makes sense. And, and we can, have, we've had many examples where we'll get a snowfall and our soils will be, you know, it'll melt off immediately and the neighbor will have snow on it. That tells me my soil temperature. I found that as we improve and advance soil health, we've been able to extend the growing season significantly before or after, you know, earlier in the year and then later in the year. And part of that, it's just healthier soils, more biologically active soil. Now, in starting out, it, you will have a problem with cold soils. Then you address it according to, you know, carbon nitrogen ratios and as far as cycling that through. And you can do that according to which crop species that you you seed or plant. Uh, as far as stripper headers, we don't use stripper headers. I, I know guys that do and they work great. I just, I, you know, I don't want to write the check for one of those. So I, I have not had any experience with them. Um, we do use stripper headers. And I, I definitely like planting a uh, stripper head. Crops that come with the strip the uh, flax, the wheat, and I, I like how it works. Sometimes when we get two weeks in a row, or the next year going back to corn, sometimes I can get, it doesn't look too good a job to keep the moisture sometimes. Um, usually what we do there when that happens, we, instead of planting corn, we might go to sunflowers and then later, and then our rotation will switch to plant. What we usually do is mile with them with flower ground because a lot of that residue is still there to protect the soil for the mile crop. And that's a little black of ground for us for the mile to make to help it make maturity. But I like the stripper heads. I like 90% of what the stripper head does, I guess. What's the 10% you know? When you can't get a plant just here. Yeah, uh, we too uh, use stripper heads and uh, like what they do for us. Um, and by and large, it's easier for us to plant behind the strip wheat than it is uh, wheat that's run through the straight head. Uh, we've had years where we get behind and have a custom guy help us or something. And, and we can 
see that. Plus, <clears throat> we like this, this difference in snow catch. Uh, it's tremendous, uh, especially on dry, dry springs. Uh, it stands out pretty easily. I don't know that, I mean, of course, our soils are a little uh, sandier and we still have so much clay, so I don't know that we have a lot of problems. The residue, if it does go flat, um, you know, if, if you have a heavy dew or something, we do have a little trouble. We have to wait until the dew goes off, so the struggle runs quite some time to get through it. But other than that, it, we really haven't had too much trouble getting through it. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Keep them coming. On your plowing your, your cover crop that you didn't lay down, how do you get it? Okay, planting the, the cash crop into a cover crop that we didn't lay down. What's the question? There's absolutely no issue with planting into a standing cover. That, you know, assuming it's terminated, and we'll always use winter to our advantage and have it terminated by winter seed. So then the residue isn't an issue. And that's one thing, you know, we're just careful of. We don't use biennial or perennial species in our covers if we're going to cash them. So then we don't have to worry about carrying that over. I would take more of a summer crop to a fall crop. A summer to a fall? Yeah. Yeah, well, we're going to either be harvesting, you know, whether it's an early seeded pea crop or, or a, you know, a winter wheat crop or something, that'll be terminated there because we'll harvest it, and then we'll go in with our, our fall seed. The shortest window for a cover, well during the growing season, if I have, if I think I have 40 days, rather than leave that land with nothing growing for 40 days, I'm gonna be growing something. You know, and we can go in there with, you know, buckwheat, millet, you know, berry, cowpea, something that doesn't take very long to establish some cover to go in there with. In the fall though, um, all I need, like this year, I was seeding fall biennials on October 8th, but we had our first killing frost September 10th. October 8th is getting kind of late for us to, but as long as I can break germ on it, we'll get it to overwinter in our soils. So I'll, I'll do it as long as I can if it's a fall biennial. The, the biennials we had a lot of options with, as I was showing you. I mean, we've had many times have established a biennial earlier, like like maybe by mid-August, and took advantage of the fall, let it grow, and then in the spring we'll let it grow and, and terminate it and go in with another different cash crop if we think there's a reason to do that. Now, I'm usually pretty frugal where I'm not going to terminate something living just to grow something else. But we have done that on that occasion. like. When there was the run-up in corn prices, we terminated some fall biannuals and, and planted corn. But normally, uh, we'll use it to our advantage, then either harvest it or graze it or, you know, combine it, whatever option we see will make us the most money. When you use the term biannual, you mean an overwintering crop? Yeah, biannual, I'm talking about winter wheat, winter trade jelly, hairy vetch, you know, something like rye, something like that. Cheatgrass, and realize that we don't have any cheatgrass problems in our perennial pastures. We just don't see that. We see a little bit of cheatgrass on some cropland, but that's easily addressed with, with uh, you know, our crop rotation, etc. But as far as mock grazing cheatgrass, I don't have any experience, so I hate to even. I'm not going to guess at that. But tell me. Any other questions? So we got some time. 
Randy, you got to have a question. You always have a question. This gentleman does. Yeah, why, why do 
buy one to bother, but it's genetically embedded in it. It has to be, because otherwise, why would you do something so stupid? You know? I mean, when it rains, where do you drive across? The plowed field or the, or the, the perfect pasture? You know? It makes no sense. So, they do it because they think they have to get rid of the residue, but if they had the proper biology and soil life, it would take care of it for them. You know, we can show you pictures where we start with a lot of residue and in no time it's down to nothing in a healthy soil. The reason they do that is because they've destroyed their soil, the life and function of the soil, plain and simple. That was an easy question. <laughs> it's on tape, Dave. That's fine. I don't know. <laughs> and you too. Any, anyone else? Just plain and simple. And as far as 
you know, it's up to each individual operation if they want to run livestock or whatever. But I would say this, if you don't have livestock and you don't care to get livestock, there's dozens of young producers out there who would love to form a partnership with you and bring livestock onto your operation. And we've seen that. We've done quite a bit of work with that up in North Dakota where we will partner up straight cash grain producers with young livestock producers, grow covers on the cash grain land, young livestock producer will come and harvest that covers with livestock. It's a win-win situation for both. We're advancing soil health on the cash grain operations and allowing a lot more grazing for the young livestock producers. So there's ways around that that are relatively easy to, to uh, address if you want, but it's up to each operation. Okay, we, uh, we have about another five minutes, ten minutes. It's the craziest thing you have ever thought of doing, but didn't you muster up to do it. <laughs> Sell out. <laughs> 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 That's a good question. I, I think I pretty much tried everything I thought I wanted to try. I guess. I uh, that's an easy one for me. I want to go right down in the Red River Valley, right where I-29 and 94 intersect, and I want to just start planting cover crops, integrating livestock, and just prove to them that it can be done. That's what I won't really want to do. That's a good one, Bob. <laughs> one more here. Another question on your cover crops. I'm along with this, the guy on the end, you know, uh, like to integrate this in the winter wheat, going to corn maybe. You know, I kind of have the hard time dragging your expensive drill across the ground, but I don't know, Gabe, Drill yours in, or do you lose like a gandy box, or have you had that much luck like aerial, just kind of on the ground broadcasting? Yeah, we we just we've tried, we've tried aerial, we've tried broadcasting. In our drier environment, it drill is by far the best result. So that's going to depend on your moisture. But it, it's you know we've done enough of this to know that that. We will improve soil health. I can't tell you the number of cover crops I've planted where I've only got this much above ground growth, but it's you know four times that below the ground. And you keep doing that for a number of years. What I tell producers is take one field, whatever size, you know, you feel comfortable. And then even if it has to be behind the hills where none of the neighbors see, and commit for five years on that field. And I've done this with producers all over the world. I have yet to have anyone make it through five years of dedicating themselves to a cover crop in a cash crop rotation and go back. Now I've had them drop out after a year or two because they didn't have the fortitude to stick with it. But once they see, because every year your soil health will advance enough, that, and that's the beauty with the Haney test, you can start really realizing the benefit to back off. And I strongly recommend, like I said earlier, all cash grain producers use that Haney test because you will notice a significant reduction in your input cost, and it'll really benefit you know but that's the thing you've got to stick with it and see because it's pretty easy to get to get frustrated after a year or two question back there yeah you said earlier that when you plant your ranch it's later it's a later view and vice earlier that they turn out better why is that yeah, usually radishes planted early in the spring, they'll just bolt and go to seed. I don't know, it's something with the, just the genetic makeup of radishes. Do you know what? I, I'm not a scientist, I can't tell you. But when we, when we plant them late June, early July, then they'll get the big tubers that you want. Why that is? It's daily. Oh, it's daily. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. After the 21st of June. After the 21st of June. Huh. See, I learned something new. Okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> One question I like to ask Gabe is, like, when you talk about the Haney test and your fertilizer, your mom fertilizer, where you're not 
using it, but if we've got a producer here that is using, starting to use cover crops and is looking at that, how do you feel the effects are of fertilizer on your biology that's in the ground? Do you think you're hurting your biology by putting too much fertilizer on there? Okay, it has, the question was of the handy test and the adding fertilizer. I still think starting out, if you've been, if your land's used to synthetics, you need to actually increase those because of what I said or my presentation this morning. Does that have a negative effect on biology? Somewhat, but the benefits will outweigh that starting out. And then, because you need to grow biomass in order to improve organic matter, improve nutrient cycling, et cetera, et cetera. And you're gonna be propagating the numbers of biology so that'll offset any negative of the synthetics right away. But then definitely use the Haiti test and start backing off when you can. One of the things we're seeing, you know, our county, Burley County, where I'm from, when I started no-till in 93, I was the only no-till or true no-tiller in that county. Now 70% of the cropland in that county is zero-till, and I mean zero-till. And a lot of the producers, when they started to diversify their rotations and move into no-till, they, they're not taking their reward, so to speak. And they kept using synthetics, using synthetics, using synthetics. Well, take your reward, and, they, and if you build the soil health, start putting it in your pocket instead of just writing checks. And now we're seeing, because of the Haney test, a lot of the producers really significantly reducing their synthetic fertilizer use without, without it negatively affecting yields whatsoever. In fact, they're getting better yields because of things like the mycorrhizal fungi that I described this morning. Question here. You were critical of the farm program. In regard to CRP, has that improved soil health? Has CRP improved soil health? I'm sure there are situations where it has. The big thing I see with CRP is I really think they should have made it be seeded to native perennial species. Like up our way, and we do have uh, land that we leased that was in CRP for 20 years. We've converted it to a grazing system, but it was 95% smooth grown, 5% noxious wheat. I mean, which, you know, we don't want. We see smooth grown as an invasive up there. Uh, did it improve soil health? It's gonna, what's gonna happen is, you're, it's just gonna become stagnant. You're gonna get noxious weeds. And, no, it didn't. It worked very short term, but uh, that, that was just a program that wasn't very well thought of. And yes, I am very critical of the farm program, and I don't mind saying so. The question was, by going into native perennials, I'll get biology established faster than with cover crops. No, what I was trying to get across is that native perennials will sequester more carbon. And as Ray and I both said, it's carbon that drives the system. So we got to get perennials back into the system for that reason. A very diverse mix of annuals will jumpstart things faster simply because you have the dying decay and roots with and organic material for that biology to feed on. So faster it'll be with annuals, but long-term carbon sequestration is with perennials. One question left. Anyone? One question left.
Okay, guys, that leads us up to our break. We'll have a 15-minute break, and we'll reconvene at 2.30. Thanks, thanks to the panel.